Hello and welcome to this broadcast from the Institute for Future Studies. My name is Gustav Arenius. Uh, I'm a professor of uh, moral and political philosophy, but also the director here at the Institute. And uh, today I'm uh, very happy to have uh, David Miller here. You're very welcome. Thank you. Uh, who has just recently given a Buddha lecture here at the Institute, but also yesterday we had a public lecture or a public discussion about uh, liberal nationalism uh, and you're also part of a big uh, conference in, uh, in uh, Uppsala. Yeah. So you are, uh, since long, a professor of political theory at Oxford University and a senior fellow of Nuffield College. And uh, you have uh, published a, a lot of books. I mean, one uh, recently is uh, about liberal nationalism and his critic with uh, Gina Gustafsson. Uh, you published Is Self-Determination a Dangerous Illusion and also Strangers in the Mist. And today I thought we were going to talk about um, exactly this idea of uh, uh, liberal uh, nationalism. That's, that's a very interesting uh, idea. So, well, I can start directly to ask you, what is this? I mean, it sounds a little bit uh, like a contradiction in terms or liberal nationalism, but it has become uh, very much discussed lately. What is liberal nationalism? So y you can see it either as a form of nationalism or as a form of liberalism, but obviously what it tries to do is to show that these two ideas are not only not mutually contradictory in the way that they're often portrayed, but actually mutually supportive. So that that's the idea is that to be a liberal, you have, in fact, to embrace a certain kind of nationalism. Whereas from the other perspective, of course, you can be a, an illiberal nationalist, but you shouldn't be. You should, be, you should constrain <laughs> your, your nationalism by, uh, by liberal values. Otherwise, it becomes potentially racist, authoritarian, and so on. So it's really an attempt to, to develop a political philosophy which draws upon both liberal and nationalist traditions and show that they actually form a coherent synthesis. Yeah, so I mean, today I think many people associate nationalism with more uh, uh, right-wing political ideas, uh, with the kind of recent development yeah. of this kind of so-called populist parties in Europe, but also other places in the world. But if you look at it historically, I mean, it's uh, not clear that uh, this has been a right-wing concept. If you look here in Sweden, for example, it can be argued that the Social Democrats uh, had an idea of, of a, so as they call it, the people's home and uh, v very much connected to some kind of nationalist ideas. Yes, I mean, I think that's right. So in different historical periods, it's been associated with liberalism, with socialism, with social democracy, and of course, with also with fascism. Mm. So, I mean, the core idea of the, the nation is the main unit of political community and the importance of the nation as a sort of source of identity, I mean that can be used exactly by these different uh, political positions. And I would argue that um, in, e in each case, it's very hard to develop the view, the position, without actually assuming some kind of national basis for it. So, of course, I mean, now many, many liberals would think of themselves as cosmopolitan. Exactly. So we yeah. should explain that. So why have liberalists become associated with cosmopolitanism and, and what is that? Right. Um, so there are different ways of looking at it. I mean, one, one way is to say that a cosmopolitan is somebody who takes liberal ideas of freedom and equality and then tries to cut them loose from their national moor moorings and apply them at global levels. So everybody globally should have the same rights to freedom and should be treated as equals. And it's, um, it's hard to see how that uh, can happen because few of these people also think that government should be exercised at global level. One or two maybe do. And there have mm. been historically um, movements to establish well government, but most liberals following Kant actually and Rawls and others pull back from that because they can see that a a world government would be uh, potentially tyrannical. It would mm. be, there'd be mm. no escape from it. There'd be no, no refuge from it. And so the, the problem then is you have these principles which, which sound fine, 
but you have no institutional basis on which to actually implement them. So that's why I think, in the end, liberals are going to be pulled back to something like nation-state as the vehicle for their ideas. So, so I guess to, to we can say that there are some different models here. We could call it the pure cosmopolitan model. It's mm -hmm. a basic idea that everybody should have the same rights and freedoms, and you would kind of go for some kind of global uh, uh, world government or something mm -hmm. like that, or world democracy. Uh, but as you said, I mean there are some people who argue for that, but many of the classical liberals, like you mentioned Rawls, they kind of pull back on that and still take the some form of uh, state, maybe a nation state, as, as mm. the kind of main uh, vehicle for, for social justice. And then it becomes hard how you're going to square this with this cosmopolitan conception of, of liberalism. And then, as you said, then rather you have to go for this kind of liberal nationalism. Have I understood it correctly? Yes. I mean, so, so you don't have to pull back all the way. So you can say that there are certain claims, uh, most centrally what those that stem from human rights that, that would, would have global scope. Mm -hmm. So the idea would be that states should bind themselves through international organizations to respect human rights. And that would be then a, a sort of weak kind of cosmopolitanism, mm -hmm. but uh, stronger forms of, of, of social justice, egalitarian social justice, would be pursued at national level. Yeah, so we talk about stronger forms, it would be mm. what people associate with the state, that they have taxes and redispute and uh, schools and uh, defense, I guess, and, and things like that. Yes. That would still be on a, so say a, yeah. a national level, whereas there still might be supranational organizations. I mean, how does the European Union come into this? Um, pretty active, <laughs> a very right. important subject that we will come back to, but in this area, I mean, that, that that's clearly is, is uh, a supranational organization. Yes. And uh, so, uh, well, the European, so from, from a liberal nationalist uh, perspective, the, the question would be, is Europe a nation? Now, I think most people would argue, certainly not yet, mm. and maybe not ever. So if that's the case, then, you, then Europe looks like a uh, an alliance of nations for certain specific purposes and not a kind of super nation, um, which would mean, I think, um, that some uh, limits would be placed on its scope to pursue these more ambitious ideas of social justice and so forth. So um, I was, I mean, I wrote a piece um, a few years back in reply to Herman Van Rompuy, who wrote this um, sort of self-justificatory <laughs> book about his time as a commissioner. And um, I argued there that the, the problem with Europe is it uh, had tried to become too much like a nation and therefore left too little space for the diversity of its constituent nations. So mm -hmm. sort of a pluralistic arg argument for a, a Europe which allowed each of its component nations to pursue their own destinies, not try to force them too much into a single mold. Uh, so Van Rompuy had this um, metaphor uh, of a convoy of ships, which he had been steering across stormy seas mm -hmm. towards a particular port. And I took great exception to this <laughs> metaphor, because it seemed to me that European nations are not just like ships that have to be shepherded in a single direction, um, but they have to be uh, you know, allowed to flourish in their own way with certain kinds of uh, a sort of insurance against outcomes that they might, uh, really bad, for example, really bad economic outcomes. So I could see Europe having a role as um, a way of protecting these nations against certain kinds of forces from outside, but I hoped without actually uh, forcing them all in the same direction. So you, you yeah. think there's, I mean, I know this is a complicated question, but yeah. do you think there's a way of, of organizing the European Union so it would be uh, supportive of, of nation states rather than uh, kind of undermining them? Because I guess your view is, uh, yeah. I mean, yes. what could I, I mean, uh, as the way you put it, that uh, by having this kind of uh, certain rules for the free movement of labor and the common market, it might have undermined the sovereignty of uh, the of, of the nation states. Yes, so I think th there has been, so, so I think the, 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 the free movement can be seen just as a, a sort of economic uh, 
a device um, to encourage efficiency and, and, uh, and, and, and employment. But I think behind it, there was this other more ideological um, idea that by having people moving around, the, the effect would be to weaken national identities, make people think more like just like Europeans. And maybe to some extent that has been the case. Um, so I don't have a hard view about this, though I do think that making it into a kind of, uh, into a rigid principle, which is what, what happen ha has happened in the European case, such that uh, free freedom of movement is treated as a non-negotiable principle, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. whatever the circumstances. Um, I think that shows the sort of rigidity, which is what I was protesting against in mm -hmm. the, the piece about Van Rompuy. Are you familiar with this paper by uh, Friedrich von Hayek, uh, going way back, where he mm. actually argue for something like the European Union just for reason to make the the, the nation state less uh, to intervene less in the economy and make it less uh, possible for the nation yes. state and for governments to intervene in the economy. He, he seemed to be uh, it seems like a prophecy. <laughs> I mean he wrote that paper I think in the end of the 30s or yeah. last time, yeah. Yes. Well, I think so the w so um yes, Hayek the, there is this um Classical liberal view, which you find also in Lord Acton in the 19th yeah, century, yeah. Yeah, that the way to restrain the power of the state is to make the state multinational. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. because of the, the, the competition between the uh, competing elements, the state will be able to do very little, and that's a good thing. And I think this, this was Hayek's view about uh, Europe. You would weaken the power of the sort of social democratic state mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. by having a, a European system. So. Mm -hmm. Um, but I think but Hayek was Hayek was wrong because in fact what we what we see actually is having a, a Europe. Well, it ha you could argue maybe he was half right. I mean, but but the European system as it evolved is certainly not entirely along classical liberal lines. No, you know, well no it's not more protective mm. of, of welfare states. Mm. Um, this was always the the German argument ag uh, in favour of European Union, which was very. When I start first started writing about uh, national self-determination and so on, and the German argument uh, was very strongly that in contemporary conditions, the only way to salvage any kind of uh, welfare state was to have it protected at European mm -hmm. level. That's really the anti-Hayek mm, argument. That's anti yeah. and, and the reason was to avoid the uh, tax competition and yes. a similar thing. Yeah. But this goes back to what, what we saw now, this idea of liberal nationalism. So so you said it's in cosmo uh, contrast to some form of cosmopolitanism. But um, so, so, so tell me again, uh, why is liberal nationalism, does liberalism need nationalism or, uh, or why is liberal nationalism needed? Two different questions. Yes. Um, so I think it, it needs, um, li liberalism needs nationalism at in two slightly different ways, and it may depend on the kind of liberalism that you have in mind. So I think any form of liberalism has to answer this, this question, which is, if you have a society which celebrates diversity, so it, in, it not only permits, but even encourages people to think in highly individualistic ways about their own lives, about their identities, so it encourages diversity of religions, of cultures, of creeds, of w ways of life, of cuisines, music, dance, whatever. So you have all this diversity, um, and yet people have to somehow find ways of working together in various kinds of collective ends that you can't avoid. So I think then there has to be something that people can appeal to as a source of unity. and. The claims of the nation form performs that function. So the old argument you find from John in John Stuart Mill mm. um, that, 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 that as as a counterbalance to a high degree of diversity, which is kind of unparalleled in human history, actually, mm -hmm. in a society, you need something to uh, counterbalance it, and that would be the nation. Now, more specifically, if you take the more egalitarian form of liberalism which yeah maybe we should explain i mean of course yes. liberalism can mean so many things yes uh, so this, uh, you can say yes. there's rather a scope from a 
more kind of classical kind of more right-wing versions mm. but often when we use the word liberalism here they can be encompassing what we usually call social democratic yes. and even further left than the social democratic yes. even right because you you then stress more a kind of egalitarianism and uh, uh, redistribution yes. so it's a, it's a kind of wide concept it doesn't really correspond to when we talk about liberal parties they can yes. be be <laughs> some yes. of the liberal parties might not even be yeah. liberal on this notion so yes i mean so so when when liberalism takes this more left wing mm -hmm. form where it's uh committed to welfare state to uh combating in the rise in inequality mm -hmm. to uh equality of opportunity and so on and a social minimum uh then it needs um to call upon the solidarity of those who would be likely to do better for themselves in a completely free market environment. So it has to persuade them to pay their taxes, you know, not to uh, try to, to, to effectively decamp offshore with all of their uh, assets. Yeah, so their in one way, it's a, a form of solidarity, yeah. I guess. It's, it's so, it's you that you you so the nation state is a is basis a for. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes. So that was originally, I mean, how I originally came to write this, write, to write about nationalism was in the course of developing in the 1980s an argument for a kind of market socialism. Mm -hmm. And uh, so my sort of question was, you know, what, what could make people uh, move beyond capitalism? in quite radical way, in such a way that they would actually be willing to uh, operate a market economy with collectively owned capital assets. And the answer to that was that they, they would have to be quite commonly oriented to forego some of the advantages that some of them would have had under capitalism. And that really the nation was the only kind of community that I could see fulfilling that function. So I actually began there in, in, in on a, uh, some people would say my thinking has evolved a bit since then. <laughs> but that was the that was the beginning point of the interest in, in national identity. Um, but that's a very interesting yeah, starting yeah. point because I mean one one question one can ask to you is uh, mm. why is the na nation state? If you think, for example, uh, that you, you could have uh, this kind of uh, allegiance and solidarity on other levels, it could be on a regional level or a city level or or yes. something like that. And you mentioned now, now this uh, form. Maybe you were talking about uh, some form of, of uh, uh, democratic socialism. It would be some form of economic democracy. Then it maybe would be inside. Uh, you have these cooperatives or companies, and rather mm. than being privately owned stock owned company, they would be owned by the people working in the company. And yeah. then maybe you would get there. You you're getting the solidarity in there. Why not that? And why the nation state? Well, you had to. So this the conclusion I came to was that. Um, to have that that kind of economy, you have to have a kind of system level con control. In other words, you mm -hmm. because there's a kind of puzzle, which is why um, since most people report that working for firms and companies organised on a cooperative basis is is quite rewarding. They like it. They mm -hmm. prefer it. Um, you might ask the question: Why do we have capitalism at all? Why don't all companies just convert themselves into cooperatives mm -hmm. and I mean the answer I, to that seemed to be that th there are certain disadvantages in being a cooperative in an environment in which most firms are organized on capitalist lines mm -hmm. and these partly have to do with obtaining finance mm -hmm. and certain kinds of also incentive structures that exist in cooperative firms mm -hmm. that may make them uncompetitive against capitalist firms yeah so but of course they can uh, they can Maybe yeah. you take some key key pe people and bring them over and pay them higher salary because usually yeah. they have a more egalitarian salary in a, in a cooperative. So then a capitalist company can pull out important people. Well, that by that too, but yeah. also there are incentives for cooperatives to convert themselves back into capitalist uh, yeah. firms. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. The founding generation sort of becomes a kind of mm. capitalist for the next generation. So there had to be a system level. If it was going to be a cooperative economy, you would have had to have had a supportive system level um, uh, change and that would have to be at national level. So why national level? Because it seemed to me that was really the only level at which you were going to get sufficient solidarity to, to make that possible. Mm -hmm. That was the level at which, at which the welfare state uh, had, had been introduced, which was just one big step in that direction. Mm -hmm. There's going to be a 
a further step and you had to call on the all of the the kind of emotional resources which i think it's very hard to um un, uh, to, to to over over it's very hard to overestimate the importance of emotional attachments actually mm. that people have to these units um we tend to think in, in rather rationalistic ways about political organization but actually um emotions i think are very important and, and nations are um are very good at tapping on people's emotions and, and drawing them into collective action and yes. so that's why it's been very important but talking about that because yes. i mean this is something yeah. that might make people worry about this talk about mm. uh, uh, nationalism but it's often built on myths and even they are constructed there's a lot of Yes. fake and false stories that uh, we make up to say that we are this people and things like that. Uh, yes. And uh, w what are your thoughts about that? I mean, uh, it, it might sometimes sound a little bit like, um, well, we need to dupe the people to believe <laughs> that they are belonging right. to the same nation to get them to act in a solidaric way. And that might not be such an appealing vision. Yes. So it's certainly part of my view that uh, nations now should be see themselves as democratic groups where everybody has a chance to contribute to the ongoing discussion of national identity what should be part of it um how you know how should we celebrate our togetherness what kinds of symbols should we adopt what festivals should we have you know what monuments should we build what mm. ones should we pull down and and so on um and when when it comes to sort of our understanding of our history as it's for example presented in school textbooks and so mm. on what should we include what should we leave out and i think i mean you've hit on a very very interesting question which is that um as part of that we have to confront the fact that people have a kind of folk intuitive grasp of their own past and their history and mm -hmm. so on which includes various kinds of stories and myths and so on about historical figures and it's quite an interesting question how far we should actually try to subject that to the full rigors of um a scholarly uh you know inquiry <laughs> yes, and yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, on one hand of course people must be free to think and say what they like um mm. but maybe it's true that to some extent nations do require a bit of mythologizing of their own past is that one part uh, of politics you could say that one part of what different political parties uh, could do or can also compete and quarrel about is exactly mm. what is the the kind of collective myth or history how yes. is this country going to be conceived so to say and that's that is a little bit of a part of the kind of uh, long term political battle battle between different political parties yes yes it's um um it, it's always it's always been the case i mean there's always there, it, there've always been contests um over the right way to describe the history even even mm -hmm. if there are some levels of agreement about what happened the terms in which you describe it what you emphasize and what you don't um have always been part party political as well mm. as uh, collective yeah. Yeah, yeah. so we soon have to wrap this up but i was just going to ask is there any any competitors who say to uh, liberal nationalists that is not cosmopolitanism and uh, as you have uh, your colleague uh, Philippe van Parijs and he mm. uh, he argues for something he called uh, patriotism yes uh, he doesn't even add liberal to it but patriotism yes. and, and sometimes it can be hard to see the difference between that and, and what you argue for but it seems to me that his idea is that you can be a patriot at many different levels from the local mm. level regional level to a state level and even re uh, then yeah. uh, European level or something like that, and and it seems to me the differences between you and him is that uh, you give some kind of priority to the nation state, whereas he yeah. wouldn't like to do that, and yeah. and the case he often brings up is uh, Belgium, and he says that look, there's actually there's no sense of talking about Belgium as such as mm. a as a nation state. It's rather you have uh, uh, you have uh, Valons and you have uh, Flanders, and then. You you do have Belgium as a state, which is a redistributive state, mm. but that is not based on an idea of a Belgian nation. Mm. What do you well think about um, that argument? I, um, say two different things, and just going back to the patriotism 
point. I mean, that's often now presented um, as an alternative to nationalism. Mm. So famously, recently by Macron, his William Lady's mm. speech in the anniversary of the First War, he contrasted his own patriotism with the nationalism of presumably people like Marine Le Pen mm -hmm. and the exactly. National Assembly, uh, her and the Rassemblement. Um, but it's very rarely spelt out, and my own view is that it's, it's really just tracking the contrast between a liberal nationalism and, and an illiberal nationalism in terms of who belongs to the national we. So for liberals, it's going to be as inclusive as possible. It's going to try and include all citizens, whereas illiberal forms of nationalism tip typically take the form of picking out a certain group of people as the authentic nationals, mm. and the rest are kind of second order, second rate. Mm -mm -mm. Uh, and this is often on, a, on an ethnic or ancestral basis. So I think, so, so in terms of patriotism and nationalism, I would say that uh, patriotism, when you, when you actually spell it out, um, turns into a liberal nationalism. On the, on the levels question, so again, liberal nationalism is um, committed to the idea that all nations have self-determination claims. Mm. So where you have these split level uh, uh, countries, um, it will try to accommodate the self-determination claims of, uh, of a, a different levels. So, so uh, you know, personally, I'm full, fully in favour of um, self-determination for Quebecois, for Scots, for Flemish, and so on. I suppose I might disagree with Philippe that there is no such thing as a Belgian nation, because mm -hmm. it seems to me that you do have the examples: um, Switzerland, Canada, the Britain, where people do have two levels of identity. And you can see this tracked in when people do studies uh, asking people who they see their, their identity as, as being with. They're often identified on different levels. And I can't see why Belgium wouldn't be one of those as well for, for people in Flanders and Wallonia. Mm -hmm. So you have this multi-level nationalism as part of the liberal position. Yeah, so it might be very hard to distinguish uh, you, uh, your view and Philippe's view. I th yes, I think so. I mean, I have a sort of uh, pragmatic reason for thinking that the state has a certain kind of priority here mm -hmm. among our identities. But that's really for in terms of what the state can achieve, which smaller and larger... But do you equate smart. state and the nation state? Do you have to... If you have a state, is, if, is it always a nation state? Because I mean, nation state seems to involve some idea of that there is a nation. You can have a right. state and maybe several nations, is what you said. So, so this would be an argument for trying to prioritize the identity that corresponds to the level of the state, assuming that mm -hmm. there is that. Of course, I if you get a radical misfit mm -hmm. between nation and state, mm -hmm. then you have a big problem. And that isn't that Belgium? <laughs> <laughs> No, I don't think so. You have the no, no. The, you have the two halves, but you have <laughs> an encompassing half. Uh, okay. Um, yeah. Now the bigger problem is where. So I wrote a piece uh, a short while back about Kashmir. Yeah. Where this is a really tough case because yes. you have the two large states, two large and two large nations, and then you have this territory which is contested between them, mm -hmm. and within that territory, people are jumbled up in all kinds of ways whether they have Indi Indian identities, Pakistani identities, or Kashmiri identities. Yeah. Uh, and it's very hard to unravel the situation. So that's a kind of real, really testing, hard testing case for, um, for liberal nationalism, I think. Mm. Yeah. yeah, so there's much to discuss about this, and I'm sure we're going to discuss it mm. more. But uh, time has run out, so many thanks for this. Thank many you thank very for the much. Very and uh, I would like to thank everybody who have uh, watched this and uh, please uh, uh, check out our homepage at uh, iffs.se if you are interested in more uh, research the research we're doing on climate ethics, artificial intelligence, uh, norm change and democracy. So please uh, check it out and I hope uh, we will see you again. Bye. <laughs>